So if you can't tell by the grin on my face, I'm very excited to talk to my next guest. She's a two-time Olympian, an author, and she's also telling the stories of athletes. Joining me now is Perdita Felician. Perdita, thanks for talking to me. Oh, my pleasure, girl. I got dressed up for you in the <laughs> isolation I time we're like in. I like it. The sparkles, the pink. You, we, we need to see positive visuals and, and people smiling and happiness. Um, first of all, how are you doing? How are you and your family doing? Uh, I'm doing okay in this time of quarantining, I say, and self-isolation. Um, I feel like I'm living in a bit of a sitcom, though, because it's my husband and I at home. Uh, we have a daughter. She's 11 months old. But then my mother has been here for two weeks. And so has my niece, who's 18. They typically don't stay with us because they're quarantining and they just haven't been here. They're staying. So I feel like I'm living in like this new reality of my mother every day. And obviously, we, we've heard that the Olympics is going to be postponed. I know you um, had a few some comments on, on social and were very supportive of Team Canada and your colleagues. You know, how did you feel after, uh, you know, the, the actual decision came down that, you know, this is going to be postponed? Yeah, I think someone needs to tell the IOC, like, what to do and where to go. And they finally figured out that they just cannot hold uh, an Olympic Games with thousands and thousands of people in one place, in one city uh, in this time. It's just really stupid, to be honest. Um, I'm proud of Team Canada. We're not ones to rock the boat, so I was kind of shocked <laughs> that they anybody. But I feel like that forced the IOC's hand. Of course, Australia followed suit. Um, and I think the athletes were more than anything relieved. I talked to a lot of them, though, girl, and like they've had their life mapped out with this moment for years. Some of them are going on to like start their families. Others are going on to like you know postgraduate education or postsecondary ed education rather. And now they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, even me, my whole summer was built around the Olympics, going there as a broadcaster for CBC. And now that's not going to happen. You know, you talk about the journey of athletes. You know, it's not just them training and making it to the Olympics. Obviously, there are, you know, different pivotal moments in their life. And, you know, can you talk about your journey um, after retiring uh, from track and field as an Olympian and as a hurdler? And, you know, what have you learned about yourself through that journey? You know, I've learned that I'm so glad to be done. <laughs> like, <laughs> out of like racing, like you know, six months out of the year, and like having the strict diet and whatnot. I mean, it was a time of my life. Don't get me wrong, but I've really learned that you know, sport for me has given me opportunity. Like, I'm a broadcaster now, um, author, uh, many other things, but sport has given me that avenue and. You know, that's why it was kind of hard to see the IOC not be that example, because we as Olympians really we want to be, you know, beacons in our community. We want to be healthy. We want to be examples. And I found that we weren't, we weren't used that way. We weren't doing that. So for me, I just find as much as I kind of sometimes want to put away the sport label, I'll be mm -hmm. honest. You know, and I want to put it aside, and I don't really always want to be pretty to the hurdler. You know, that is what I'm known for. That's the people, you know see me as and that's opened many doors um but for me it's always something I'm, I'm gonna cherish and i think i've told athletes especially the ones i've been talking to on twitter and in my dms on social media about them really being bummed about what to do with the olympics being delayed one more year you know a lot of them aren't sure if they're going to continue or if they can afford to continue and what i've imparted on them is yeah, don't get this chapter back okay mm -hmm. i'm about to be 40 this year yay <laughs> 40 year olds i'm going to be you know older you know in a new in a new decade in my life and i kind of like i don't really miss it but there's something about like just the ease of like the way my body would work and how it would be i kind of miss that but i also really like watching from the couch as well so i'm torn i'm torn girl I want to touch a little bit on representation. You know, I know you had a daughter, but I know you're also in the community um, mentoring other young people, speaking at, you know, events where young people are. Um, tell me a little bit about why that's so important to you. Yeah. You know, I think if you see it, you feel like you can achieve it. And, you know, that's something I take as a responsibility, like being an example, being, in a, being a beacon. And, you know, growing up, there were tons of black women, you know, on TV. Um, Tanya Lee Williams from Young and the Rest says, hey girl, I love watching her from YNR. And but she wasn't an athlete. She wasn't, you know, in the sport realm. And so I feel like we need those examples to our young people. Um, you know, basketball is great and sports are great, but there's, there's the field of play, but there are also things that you can do behind the scenes. Come here, mom. Look, yeah, just bring, bring her into the, bring her into the shot. <laughs> 
we were just we were just talking about her. Hi, is that your mom? <laughs> Hi, mom. How are you doing? I told you to be here. That's okay. So yes, yeah, so, you know, we were talking about you, um, you know, being example for other young athletes, you know, you have your daughter and, you know, um, there's so much, you know, many campaigns now and talk about body image and um, representation and, and, you know, there's more work that we could do, I think, um, to normalize the fact that women obviously are in sports, they come in every walk, shape and sizes. Um, and people need to start talking about that a little more because it, it might discourage other young people who want to actually pursue a career like you did in sports from actually doing it. Yep. No, it's true. And I, I think that what I love about this digital era is that anybody can make their own content. Anyone can have their own platform. And it's important for if you don't see it, you go out and create it, which is why I love what you do, right? You're Thank like, you. there's a gap. There's a need, I'm gonna create it, right? And you see how people have flocked to this platform. And I feel like it's important for all of us to, you know, don't wait for someone to give you a seat at the table. You know, and I love to say when you say, I bought this table, I made this table, right? And sometimes we wait for those invitations and it takes too long. You know, do oh, it yeah. yourself. And it's this is the era that we're in. I think it's 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 a powerful thing that we see women of all shapes and sizes and colors and abilities, you know, really owning their space in the world of sport and fitness. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because I talk to a lot of young people to myself when I go to panels and they say, you know, I didn't know black women were, you know, running their own sports organizations or doing this and that. And it encourages them. It really does. So I'm going to segue a little bit into the show that you're working on. I think you've been doing it for a couple of years now. How did the concept, how did that come about? How did you get involved? And, and tell me, what is it that you're really trying to do with sharing those stories? Yeah, so this show is called All Around Champion. So it airs on TVO uh, if you're in Canada and BYU TV if you're in the States. And it's a sport reality competition. We've taken 10 elite athletes from across North America, from diving, swimming, gymnastics, to like skateboarding. Um, and what they do is they compete against each other in those sports they, have, they know nothing about. So every week is a new sport. It's packaged over 11 weeks. I am their host and their mentor of sorts. And so initially when I got asked to do this, um, to be their host, um, I was one of a few in a name of hats. And I remember telling them I was pregnant with Nova at the time. I remember saying, well, um, you know, I'm happy to be considered, but I'm free now. So chances are by the time you film this thing, my daughter will only be a few weeks old. And uh, yeah, baby. Yeah, she's and like, I have something to say. <laughs> I was like, I probably can't do it, but happy to be considered. Didn't think I'd hear from them. Then I get a call that um, Noah was in the NICU. She was born at four pounds, you know, a lot of complications, but she's, she's fine now, as you can tell, she's great. And, um, but it was a hard decision and the answer was no. And, um, you know, my mom really encouraged me to take the opportunity. And so I did all last summer, we filmed season one and I've never hosted a show before, steep learning curve, you know, being a speaker as you know, mm -hmm. and being a broadcaster different than, you know, really, being, you know, the top and the bottom of the show, like every day for about 12 weeks. And um, the concept I love is because you take young athletes, they have three days, yes, baby, they have three days to train for this event, and then they compete at the end of the week. And at the end, whoever has the most point is points is crowned the all-round champion. And the crazy thing, so we wrapped in August of 2019. Fantastic, put it on my, on my bucket list. And then in November, I get a call talking about, oh, they saw all the episodes of season one, the network. They love it. They want to green light season two. I'm on my good, good business. Okay. <laughs> I gotta go, and now they want to do the winter version. I'm like, do y'all know I'm a summer Olympian? Like, I don't, I don't do cold and stone ice. Um, but I did it again, and we just wrapped season two um, right before the coronavirus and the self-isolation thing came down. And so season two will air... Uh, in October of 2020, and this is week two of, episode, of season one, which just aired on TVO. Um, so Thursdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays in Canada at 5 p.m., and uh, in the States it's 8 p.m. every Thursday on BYU TV. Yeah. That's amazing. So do you want to, before I ask the next question, do you want to, yeah. Bye! <laughs> she's like, she's like, she's like ready for TV. She's like, I have something to say. You can talk to my mom after. <laughs> 
I want to talk to you about uh, becoming an author and, you know, um, where did that inspiration come from to want to tell your story in print and in that way, or obviously through audiobooks? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm an author. Honestly, this has been on my dream since I was probably nine years old that I want to write a book. I had no idea what the book would be about. <laughs> um, but it came, came out that my mother's life and her journey from St. Lucia to Canada um, when she was a teen mother and ended up being a, like a domestic worker was like a remarkable story. Uh, she ended up coming to Canada and getting pregnant with me by accident. I wasn't planned. She had to decide what to do. And really the story unfolds with this kind of like haphazard, very just arduous and struggle life with my mother, right? For, for a lot of, of my childhood. And so I really tell that story, but I leave it through sport. The inspiration for me was really just to give a voice to that part of my childhood, because I feel like I talk about myself as an athlete and, you know, gold medalist and all these things, but that was a part of my life that I never really got to share. It also takes away the veil from a lot of stigmas in my life that I held about, you know, being a fatherless child, essentially. Um, I don't know my father, don't know anything about him. And it's really just telling that story. So I go back and I piece together my mother's life. I piece together my origins. And then I show it and I weave our lives together, mother, daughter, you know, with this re remarkable story that I felt I've lived through sport. But you see that this journey as an athlete was only possible because of the hurdles and the leaps that my mother took in her life. And so, you know, the book is My Mother's Daughter. Uh, it's supposed to be out. April 14th, but it's not now basically because of, you know, Corona-19. It's just not the right time. So we'll push it back, you know, maybe to September, maybe to next March. Um, but I'm excited to fully tell that story when the time is right. I almost feel like it is the right time. You know, people need inspiration. Um, I know that there's there's uh, commitments and 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 uh, agreements that have to align with your, your book publisher and stuff. But I'm like, I want to read it. <laughs> Well, here's the good thing. It's still available for pre-order. So if okay. it comes out this fall, people can still pre-order. And I, I'd encourage them to do that. Because, of course, like, you know, supporting authors, creatives in this time. And I agree. I think the time is right. But I feel like, you know, like you said, like, things are just hard. Like, there's bookstores aren't open. Libraries aren't open. Yeah. And people access things so many different ways. But I feel like, you know, digitally, hopefully, you know, things like this, even us talking can inspire people. Like, get your next idea together, do whatever it is you need to do. So when the time is right and people have emerged from this time, you know, there is still this kind of this, all these new stories to really tell and discover. How else are you using your platform and voice to inspire young girls in sport? We know um, a lot of young girls drop out of sport, um, you know, just after they hit puberty. Um, some go to university and don't participate in sport. Like I wish I had signed up for the volleyball team at York University because um, I was doing really well in high school and I didn't. I, you know, obviously there's different reports coming out as to why that happens. But how are you lending your, your voice or your platform to that issue? Yeah, I think I've been you know, lending my voice to this for a really long time uh, through Right to Play, which is an organization that essentially takes sport and play to disadvantaged communities across Canada and the world. Um, I've traveled to West Africa with them. I've traveled all across Canada with them. And so for me, really, my, my messaging is I just try to be an example. I just try and live. And I just try and show other women what's possible and what's attainable for them. You know, like you alluded earlier, I do a lot of mentorship. Um, I don't speak to the rafters about that because it's more like one-on-one -on -one relationships and, 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 and you know, partnerships with young women navigating their way either through university or, you know, transitioning from, you know, NCAA to now, what do I do with my life that I'm not mm -hmm. an athlete? Or, or simply if it's, you know, talking to Olympians now, a few of them um, who are a little bit confused about really what to do with the Olympics being delayed for one year. And so I feel like that's the space that I hold now really not shying away from my ups and my downs, but taking those experiences. And if you, you know, if there's something that I can impart and, and, and share with you and tell you, I try and do that. Um, but now I feel like as a mother, you know, my main job is getting Nova, you know, to understand that she's a young, powerful girl and anything that she wants to do, whether it be in sport or out of it, is achievable and is possible for her. And so for me, at the end of the day, I hope that every day that I live is just, you know, a little bit more of this legacy that I'm hoping to, to leave for my daughter and obviously other women um, in, this, in this industry. And what else will you be working on once we get to the other side of Corona? Um, or are you are you working on some stuff now? Um, you know, what else is to come for, for Perdita? And as you said, your legacy. 
Yeah, you know, what's the cop? I'm going to be honest. I was uh, filming uh, season two of All Around Champion from basically January to March. And I'm doing a lot of like chilling, I'll be honest. Like, I feel for everyone on the front lines and I, I want people to be safe. My mother works in a nursing home, so she's, you know, confronting this all the time. But I know for me personally, it's just right now, just, just to be. Um, project wise, obviously promoting the show All Around Champion, season one that's on right now on TV and on TV. My book, My Mother's Daughter, um, is available on Amazon.com. Um, it's also available on Indigo Chapters. So you can go online and pre order. And hopefully, it'll be out here uh, really soon. And when the Olympics come to play in 2021, um, I'll be there with CBC as a broadcaster. Uh, I'll be your in stadium host from track and field. And, you know, continue, honestly, really just hopefully be a really shining example of, of what you can do um, with your voice, the same way that you are. And, you know, it's been great to be on today and chat to you, giving us something to, like, watch and do while we're all at home isolated. It's, it's yes. so great. It's so great. And I guess my one of my last questions will be, um, you know, we hear the terms inclusion, diversity, gender diversity in sports a lot. What else do you think the sports industry as a whole can do to get to the place where they look at women as equal in sports? You know, we see, uh, you know, the soccer team in the States, hockey teams were, were fighting for pay equity. You know, when you hear these stories of athletes, even at the varsity level of what they're making compared to um, athletes who are male in the varsity level, I sometimes I look up and I'm like, oh my gosh, we're in 2020 and this is still a problem. You know, what more do you think can be done to, to kind of close that gap? Yeah. I think um, we as women have to keep using our voices. We have to still keep making um, the people who hold the power and the decision makers uncomfortable. Um, you know, TSN, we saw for Black History Month, uh, they're celebrating Black History Month, which is great. But, you know, there was a bit of a firestorm. Um, the image went viral that they only had men, Black men on their posters and not Black women. Um, end up having a conversation with one of their executives higher up, just a private conversation, and they vowed to do better. But I could tell that making them uncomfortable was right. And simply me writing a tweet saying, what the heck is going on, hopefully enacted some change and put some fire under them. But I'm going to tell you where this really starts. It starts with our little boys. It starts with if you're a father or a mother, having little boys, and maybe you don't believe in feminism. Fine, you don't have to teach your little boy to be you know, a feminist. But teach him to respect women. The mm -hmm. minute he can start talking, speak him, speaking, teach him that he's no better than his little sister or big sister, but that they are all equal. And I feel like if you start teaching our, our, our boys and our men that women are just as great and just as strong and powerful as them, then this next generation, it starts to be a thing. We of the norm. Have, yeah, the norm, exactly. We don't have to scream it and yell it. They will actually be living this. And to me, that is really where it starts. So maybe I'm talking about having baby number two. I don't know. <laughs> just joking, just joking. Um, I love it. <laughs> You know, this next generation of babies, Generation C is what some people are calling them. Like, I'll be surprised. Anyways, different, different conversation. We're segueing. But the point is, I really feel like it's great that we're still talking about this. But I feel like you, it's 2020. Yeah. When it's gonna, like, it needs to stop. But I never, and I, but I hope it does. Yeah, it's, it's more action than roundtables and, and, you know, getting people's opinions. It's like, what can we do? You know, I, I, I've. Sometimes I'm amazed, especially with the narrative that there's nothing to show on TV when it comes to sports. There's lots to show. There's lots of women like yourself that we should be hearing from. Um, there's, you know, indigenous athletes we should be hearing from um, just because uh, there's no spring training or, um, you know, a series that's going to be ending in terms of male sports doesn't mean that there's nothing. There's no content out there that we should be uh, focusing on. But that's my own <laughs> little rant. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you or to find out um, some updates and, and what's going on with you? Yeah, um, I post a lot, probably a little bit too much, to my Instagram story. So it's at Perdita Felician, uh, and that's my handle on Twitter. That's my handle on LinkedIn. If people are still using Facebook, that's my handle there too. But uh, you can find me online. I'm always responding to comments and chatting back. So yeah, definitely hit me up. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Uh, it was a great conversation. Um, all the best with everything that's to come with you. I feel like your light is just so bright, you know, and, and you're going to probably get more calls of people wanting to work with you and for you to, to continue to share those stories of, of athletes. Let us know when your book drops. We're happy to, to shout it to the rooftops as well. And uh, stay safe and healthy. And, uh, you know, say hi to your mom again. Thanks for uh, letting us see baby Nova. <laughs> <laughs>